Well, yes, flat picking and uh, talk of uh, outhouses. I feel right at home <laughs> in my hillbilly soap. I'll have a little bit of Hot Springs, Arkansas water for that. Because it says on the bottle, it's good for me. Must be true. Last week, I uh, shared a series of three tweets that I saw recently on American Atheist Twitter. The first tweet read, I quickly became an atheist after leaving an Orthodox Christian faith. Five years later, I'm open to spirituality, but absolutely no organized religion. Now, the response came back, I cannot get my head around what is meant by spirituality. Are we really talking about spirits in this day and age? LOL. And the response came back from the first tweeter. For me, spirituality is embracing the unknown with a sense of awe and childlike wonder. There's plenty we still don't know about life. I'm open to the strangeness of the universe without dogma. Now, as I pointed out last week, these three tweets demonstrate not only personality differences among secular non-religious people, such as humanists and atheists and agnostics, but also a generational divide. And in a multicultural, multi-generational congregation, such as First Unitarian Society, respecting diverse ideas is what we do. It's part of the practice of a relational communal gathering. After all, every week we repeat our congregational covenant and say, this is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. And we mean that. Both humanism and Unitarian Universalism stand or fall according to how those already within the movement greet people wanting to come into the movement. How are they greeted? To help frame how this works, I pointed out last week that I see humanism as breaking into three distinct historical periods. The late 19th and early 20th century humanism that closely followed the thinking of pragmatist philosophers like William James and John Dewey. That's the first period and that's the one that formed here in 1916. The second distinct period of humanism was born out of the experience of the Second World War. This humanism was a result of vast federal spending on science and technology, which led to explosive growth in American universities and built the America that we live in today, including the sprawling segregation of American suburbs and neighborhoods and the brutalizing extremes of poverty and wealth we have in our nation. The humanism of that second period reflected the optimism of the time, a vision of science and technology, building a nation of educated, affluent citizens. But as I said last week, that didn't happen. I'm calling the attitude of the second uh, tweeter, a, the second wave humanism, a, I think I'll call it suburban humanism with all the dripping irony that uh, suburban has that come to reflect scientism, opportunity hoarding, and white flight. As I see it, a new humanism, a third wave of humanism is struggling to be born, one that, as the third tweet expresses it, exhibits an openness to strangeness. Because if there's one thing our planet has plenty of at the moment, it is strangeness. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the thought worlds. In theology, it's called a social imaginarium, reflected by those two different tweeters. In our strange world today, there's a lot of anti-enlightenment sentiment. When we talk about the age of enlightenment, the focus is generally on the late 17th and early 18th century, when ideas such as, oh, the scientific method, secular government, representative government, individual rights, and the rule of law became popular topics among Europeans. To complicate the picture, it was also the era of murderous expansion 
of European colonialism and of racialized slavery. Now, there are lots of things to respect and lots of things to criticize about European Enlightenment thought. But one thing that often gets forgotten in our contemporary dismissal of the Enlightenment is that the criticism of those ideas is nothing new. I would even argue that there's been far more ink spilled through the centuries criticizing the Enlightenment than in praising its aims. The European artistic matrix nowadays called Romanticism was an early reaction against the increased focus on reason and science of the day. And if you've ever taken your European history class, you memorize the periods, Middle Ages, Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, Romanticism. And yes, it's a pendulum swing. The Romantic movement started in Germany, it spread across Europe, and eventually it even got to the backwards United States among Unitarians, and we called that transcendentalism. The essence of all those movements in the center of the criticism today is that scientific thought and reason is reductive. The questions are always the same. Where's the mystery? Where's the art? Where's the Sturm und Drang? Where's the spirituality? Where's the room for strangeness? Where's the wonder and awe in a naturalistic, materialistic view of the cosmos. Now, one person who took the question of reductivism extremely seriously was a Scottish writer of the 19th century named Thomas Carlyle. Yes, he is the essence of Victorianism as well, and you can't smile if you're a Victorian. Not much is known today outside of universities about Carlyle, but he was one of the most influential writers of the 19th century to American writers uh, from uh, 1830s through the Civil War, roughly. Carlyle's thought was so important to artistic young Americans that the young and then unknown Ralph Waldo Emerson took ship to Scotland, showed up on Thomas Carlyle's doorstep unannounced, and thus began a bromance that lasted through almost the entire 19th century because both of these guys had very long lives. At the end of his life, deep in dementia, Emerson still recognized and commented on photos of Carlyle. Now, the book that inspired an entire generation of American writers and created transcendentalism was a novel by Carlyle from 1831 titled Sartre Resartarus, The Life and Opinions of Herr Teufelsdreck. Thanks, Paul, for helping me speak German, sort of. Sartre Resartarus is Latin. I can read that one. It's Taylor Retailored. You know, Taylor as in sewing clothes, Retailored. In the novel, Carlyle creates a character named Diogenes Teufelsdreck, meaning something along the lines of God-born devil's dung. Uh, yeah, and those are the kind of, that's the level of humor for, in Carlisle, but frank, <laughs> frankly, right? For, but Teufelsdreck is a troubled young German romantic scholar who has written a book titled Clothes, Their Origin and Influence. Now, by the way, Carlisle is credited with creating the nowadays university study of clothing which did not exist at the time that he made it up, and apparently he thought that was too absurd and greatly funny, but he also invented the, the, the study in universities. So what was Carlyle saying that was so new and exciting to those young Americans of the early 19th century? For one thing, Carlyle was fluent in German, and so read the German Romantic poets and philosophers in the original before those were being translated into English. So he was talking about something brand new in the English-speaking world. What did Carlyle say? He titles one chapter of that novel, Natural Supernaturalism, and says this, for example, existence itself is miraculous. Life contains elements of wonder that can never be defined or eradicated by physical science. You get the idea of the criticism. You can see how this idea summarizes what young Americans were looking for, a way to transcend the senses and materialism 
and therefore evading the reductive scientific way of thinking while at the same time respecting those advances in applied technology, reason, and science. That was their program. Carlyle said this in a letter from the time, that the supernatural differs not from the natural is a great truth, which the last century, especially in France, has been engaged in demonstrating. The philosophes, that's the French philosophers, and yeah, uh, Carlyle didn't like the French, but he did like the Germans, so that's why he's criticizing the French. They went far wrong in this, that instead of raising the natural to the supernatural, they strove to sink the supernatural to the natural. The gist of my whole way of thought is to do uh, not the latter, but the former. Now, he also was a very uh, um, effulgent writer, shall we say, using way too many words. But if, instead of raising the natural to the supernatural, they strove to sink the supernatural to the natural. And of course, that word sink says everything about his program. Carlyle's project, which became the project of Unitarian Transcendentalists in the US and other Americans like Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, became an effort to raise the natural world to the level of the supernatural world, to enchant the world that reductionist science and materialism they saw as damaging. As Emily Dickinson wrote scandalously for that time period, some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying home with a bobolink for a chorister and orchard for a dome. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along." End quote. Carlyle praised the writing of the young transcendentalists for, quote, the recognition of a higher faculty than understanding of reason the pure, ultimate light of our nature. And by the way, uh, he's pointing out a common mistake that a lot of people even today make about transcendentalism. Uh, and when you're looking at a Dickinson or an Emerson or Thoreau, you, you can't get it backwards or you don't get it. They were not searching for ways to exist on pink clouds of transcendent imagination in some sort of fantasy world. They were looking for ways to express real clouds that can be seen and painted and photographed. They wanted the actual wonders of our existence on this planet, and that they thought would reveal the pure, ultimate light of our nature. So, instead of getting to heaven at last, we could be going all along. Awe, wonder, mystery, strangeness, the pure ultimate light of our nature. Now for strange, how about the Tiktaalik rosei, a reptile from the late Devonian period, which I haven't memorized, but it's 375 million years ago about. Many now think that the Tiktaalik is the so-called missing link, a sea creature that by random mutation evolved the ability to survive part of the time out of the water, thus gaining an edge that eventually led its descendants, such as Homo sapiens, to exist on land. Now, you can purchase a throw pillow to celebrate your ancient relative tick, by the way. Uh, all you gotta do is go online. I'm a proud descendant, right? <laughs> you can even purchase greeting cards to send to all your relatives, celebrating the real relative, which is tick. There he is doing his acrobatics onto land. Yep, he is everyone's relative. Awesome, I'd say, wonderful, mysterious, strange the pure ultimate light of our nature. Then we have this creature, the epulet shark. It's contemporary, it's a news story. Epulet sharks are evolving right before our eyes. 
Some epaulets are adjusting to the disappearance of water due to climate change by spending more and more and more time on land. They are now ranging up to 100 feet from the water's edge, and it's getting bigger. In the case of the epaulet shark, we may well be looking at the next master of our planet long after the environmentally disastrous reign of Homo sapiens has been long forgotten. Could be awesome, mysterious, and strange, I would say, to think about. I hasten to mention that I love living in a naturalistic world. I don't believe the universe has a purpose, and I don't think it's headed for any particular purpose, and that's good with me. I don't believe that human beings are the cosmos attempting to be aware of itself any more than the, it's, the universe is attempting to be aware of itself through all the other conscious beings, sparrows, squirrels, rabbits. I also don't believe that human consciousness continues to exist after death, and that's real good with me. The vast recycling center that is our cosmos is all the eternity that I feel like I need, because just imagine all the places we're going to go and all the things we're going to look like as we get recycled endlessly through our cosmos. We are conscious animals among many other varieties of conscious animals. We are on a planet among many other planets. We are in a solar system among many other solar systems, and that, I think, is awesome and mysterious and strange. What Thomas Carlyle attempted to achieve with the concept that he called natural supernaturalism was raising the natural world to the level of the supernatural, to enchant the material world that science and human senses easily perceive and thus, sadly, we forget just simply to look around us at how amazing this world is. Natural supernaturalism nowadays is called religious naturalism, but that's a, a, a term that only comes in the 1970s and 80s. Now, Dr. Demian Wheeler, a philosopher of religion at United Theological Seminary in St. Paul, defined religious naturalism in this way at a forum that he offered right here at First Unitarian Society. Quote, religious naturalism is a perspective that regards nature as both exhaustive of reality, meaning there's no supernatural, and worthy of deep reverence and devotion. On the one hand, nature is all there is. There is no such thing as the supernatural. On the other hand, it is both possible and desirable to live a spiritually fulfilling existence on a completely naturalistic basis. Now the photos that are on the wall, thanks Tim for putting those up, are from the Hubble telescope. We've had them for a while. So far, the Hubble has photographed objects as far away as 10 to 15 billion light years. And the farthest area that it has probed is called the Hubble Deep Field, 10 to 15 billion light years away. Now the photos on the screen are from the James Webb Space Telescope that is, has just now started operating. The James Webb Space Telescope has now peered 35 billion light years away, more than twice as far. Now, if those photos don't knock your socks off, as, again, my old hillbilly saying is, you ain't got no socks. <laughs> Dr. Wheeler says it this way, for the religious naturalist, nature itself is capable of evoking awe, wonder, gratitude, amazement, celebration. Nature itself is the object of our, our ultimate concerns, that's theological talk for God, right? Ultimate concerns and commitments. Nature itself is sacred, i.e. vitally and centrally important, and thus deserving of our utmost loyalty. And Thomas Carlyle couldn't have said it better, right? Being or becoming transcendent is not the right term for a mystical experience that convinces you that all that you see in the natural world is really supernatural. 
As Thomas Carlyle said, that the supernatural differs not from the natural is a great truth. And as for me, I would say that that is the greatest truth of them all. And not only is it a truth, as I mentioned last week, it's also a fact. How do we achieve the wholeness that we feel we've lost? Well, by re-enchanting our worlds. How do we each enchant our world? By becoming, oh, I don't know, how about becoming a magician or a wizard or some kind of artist? Artists doing all sorts of arts, even the fine art of creating ourselves. The poet, visual artist, and Unitarian, E.E. E. Cummings wrote, the artist is no other than he who unlearns what he has learned in order to know himself. And I'll broaden the genders out a little bit on that one and say, artists are no other than those who unlearn what they have learned in order to know themselves. That's the invitation that life extends to each of us in our religiously naturalistic world, to experience deeply the pure, ultimate light of our nature, so that instead of going to heaven at last, we're all going all along. <laughs>